guess this I guess this is a giant and everyone can see it. So I, maybe maybe I should have repeated the diagram, but an intense laser pulse is focused on a gas of of inert atoms, uh, most usually neon or argon, but it could be any inert gas. They want it to be inert because they don't want electrons to be pulled off too easily. Okay, the the three step process, which is imagined, it's breaking the process, which is likely a, not just three discrete steps, but some overlap here. But the first um, observation by Paul Corkum uh, in Canada was that you could actually describe this as three separate steps and you'd get really good answers. And so the first step is that the, the um, with the um, incident intense laser field, uh, with, with the neon, with, I'm sorry, with one of the atoms immersed in this field, the electric field of the laser lowers the potential of, of what's binding the electrons to the atom and they can tunnel through. The laser field should be just enough to lower the barrier to make it easier for electrons to get out. But as you'll see in a moment, not too, not too strong a laser field don't want it to be exactly comparable to the binding electric field from the, you know, the shielded uh, nucleus. But anyway, that's the first step. Get the get the electron out, and the mathematical model is will use is that just at the instant that it gets out, um, which we would call the birth of the free electron, that its initial velocity is zero. So that's one of the approximations of the three-step model. As the electron tunnels out, it has no, no velocity, no kinetic energy. The second step is that, okay, now, there's a, now this electron is out and it's free and it has no initial energy, but it's in this intense laser field and it gets accelerated uh, depending on where it is uh, in the phase. Uh, it gets accelerated in one direction or the other uh, in the laser field and uh, can reach very high kinetic energies, um, uh, up around 100 EV actually. Uh, and then it returns to the parent ion where it started from, okay? So, and, and in the return, the big question is, how much energy will it have on return? We'll go over that again. And then the third step is radiative recombination. So now this electron is returning, uh, what's the likelihood it's going to find and be reabsorbed by the the ion, into the ion that it left behind? So that's called recombination. Okay. So this is a slide that we had for step one before, and we talked about the Keldish parameter, and um, where this is in terms of the so-called uh, ponderomotive potential, which is truly, which is actually the cycle average kinetic energy of the electron in the field. And this is the ionization potential, which will be relatively high uh, so, uh, for, in, for the neon, uh, for the inert, um, for the closed shell um, ion, uh, atoms, okay? And, and I have a, a bit of a hard time with this formula. Uh, Lorena is gonna say, add a comment in a moment about it. What does it mean that that tunneling is best when gamma k is much less than one, meaning this is much less than one. And I'm going to rewrite this formula in a moment to make so it makes a little bit more sense. Okay. So, um, okay. So here's an added slide which I just stuck in. It comes from a uh, a nice paper by Thomas Pfeiffer, who spent some time here. I think he was in Steve Leone's group or Dan Newmark's group um, half a dozen years ago um, or more ago. And this is an article he and his colleagues wrote in um, um, Reports on Progress in Physics. Th this is a journal you might want to be aware of. It always has really high quality articles uh, on some relevant area of physics. And they have this nice article. And I copied this one um, figure out of it. And on the same page, this equation, which we recognize, okay? And um, so, uh, so here's, an, here's, 
here's what they're showing is the potential. This is the potential curve. This is the energy level for an electron, a valence electron in the atom. So the, ad it's, so the electron is confined to stay within the atoms. This is the, um, um, what do you call it? This is the continuum. This is where the continuum starts at this dashed line. So if you, if the, you can get the atom out, uh, this would be where it would become a free electron. So these are the binding uh, potentials. And this is showing that, for instance, you could have a process in which three photons have enough energy to kick the electron out. That's one of the possible ionization processes. Uh, a second one, which, and the one that we're interested in, is where the added laser field uh, is, is, is oriented such that it's pulling down the barrier in one direction and pushing it up in the other. And if the laser field is strong enough, this curve will be depressed enough so that some electrons can tunnel through here. So that the main part of the electrons in this case would remain inside, okay? But um, probabilistically, some of them would be able to tunnel through, okay? And that's what's shown here, some electrons coming out, okay? So it depends on how strong the electric field is, how much this is, how much the, the binding potential is um, pushed down, okay? And this, is, and, and this is our case for high harmonics. We want only a few electrons to come out, one per, uh, per atom. And, um, uh, and this is a different case. This is what they call, uh, it's not over the top, but over the barrier okay, over the barrier where the, the potential barrier uh, binding the, uh, the electrons is pushed so far down by the laser that lots of electrons can just flow right out. And in this, this is the case where we, we speak about the laser just ripping electrons off the atoms. They just flow right out. For us, for high harmonics, that would not work so well because then we have too many electrons. We'd have an electron plasma and what we'd be creating is a laser produced plasma. We would not get harmonics in this case, okay? What you want is just a few electrons out. And that's, that's what is said to be captured in the, um, the Keldish parameter here. And I just, and which is defined here, by the way, just let me repeat it. It's the square root of the ionization potential over twice this ponderomotor potential. Again, again, this being the kinetic energy averaged over a cycle, okay? And there's a, an assumption went into this formula, uh, which we didn't always say, and that is omega tau is much, much less than one. Omega is the laser frequency, and tau is the tunneling time to get through this, okay? That product is much less than one. And what that's saying is the tunneling time is very short compared with the frequency, you know, their inverse relation in units. Uh, the tunneling time is so short that on its way out, the, elect the electron, the tunneling electron sees a relatively constant electric field. That's one of the assumptions that goes in here. And that if the, uh, so that's saying that um, if this is short, that's saying this is long, relatively long, okay? That the laser frequency is relatively uh, high compared to the tunneling times. The tunneling time that's short and relative to that, omega is long. And you notice here that UP also depends on omega. This is one over UP, so this is gonna have an omega in the numerator and you take the square root of it. But when we say it's much, much less than, I think a part of that much, much less than unity in order to be in this operating mode, I think that has a lot to do with this omega being relatively long, uh, long uh, high, uh, uh, relatively low frequency. In other words, the laser frequency is low. It doesn't seem that low, but it, what, it, what it means is, or relative to the fact that the time of, um, of a tunneling is very short. So the tunneling time is short compared to a laser time, and a laser time is a few femtoseconds, so you're into the attosecond tunneling time. Okay, so that's a new slide.
Lorena, Lorena, do you want to break in now? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how much I have to add, but like what Professor Atwood and I after class yesterday were talking about, like the different regimes of that Keldish parameter. And I think of it pretty simply as the ionization potential is like how much energy does it take to pull an electron off of your atom? And the ponder motive potential is how good is your laser at putting energy into pulling an electron off of your atom? And so if your ionization potential is really high or your ponder of motive potential is really low, then that um, gamma, that Keldish parameter is going to be big and you're just never going to ionize anything. And so you definitely want the Keldish parameter to be small in order for you to get any ionization, any sort of tunneling. But then if you go too far, then your ponder of motive potential is huge relative to your ionization potential and you're just ripping electrons off left and right. And that's that plasma case that's like case C on the diagram there. So there's some optimum Keldish parameter for tunneling, which is much less than one so that ionization is happening, but isn't too small. So you're making plasmas. So I think like that's, that's the, like, to me, the physics that the Keldish parameter captures. I don't know. Yeah. So I might, I might add a thought. I, I, um, this is the square root of these two things. So in a way, this is going to be, the square root of the ionization potential is going to f involve the binding electric field. So somehow or other you could put an electric field here and the UCP involves the electric field of the laser and you're gonna take the square root again and there's an omega. So basically you can write that gamma is some elect uh, binding electric field due to the screen nucleus divided by the laser uh, electric field and the omega goes into the numerator. So it, I think it gives a little bit easier um, interpretation of all that. So, okay, I think that's, uh, does someone else want to speak up on this issue? Okay, so that was step one of the three-step process. And we spoke enough about what these things are. I think they're really clear. So we'll just skip forward to where we were. Up, 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 up. So now we want to look at, okay, the electron is born. Uh, it's been just released into the laser field. And um, so we'd, li we'd now like to see what happens in step two. Does, what is the mathematics and how much energy does it gain and how much energy does it bring back uh, upon... Uh, the potential um, uh, impact, okay, recombination. So what we'll solve is uh, the, the force equation, mass acceleration equals the Lorentz force with an applied electric field. This is the laser field, E0, okay? And uh, that gives us the acceleration. And if we integrate twice, we get the velocity and we get the position. Uh, uh, me measured away from the, the place where it was born, okay? And upon doing those integrations, we have integration constants, which are the initial velocity and the initial position. So uh, the initial velocity we said in the three-step the three -step model was zero. So the initial velocity is zero. And the initial position, we're, we're going to call that zero also. That's just the position at the, uh, at the parent ion or atom, okay? So just at, that's at the time of birth. Uh, and these calculations are done in terms of a phase. The phase is the laser frequency times a time, okay? And a time is, we'll measure the time from the peak of the pulse, which is a, um, a cosine term. Okay, so you'll see phase and you just have to remember that phase is omega times time and phi zero is the time of birth. It's not, it's not necessarily anywhere in this phase omega t. It's just, it is the time of birth. Okay. So, um, so, okay, with the initial conditions, we can solve for 
uh, uh, V0 and X0 from, from those equations, right? Go back here. With these equations, okay, we're going to solve for them um, with these, with these, okay? And, um, So this, this is a solution we're gonna get for V0 and X0, and then we're gonna set them equal to zero, right? Because that's the initial condition, okay? So the time-dependent velocity, if we go back here, the time-dependent velocity has these two terms. This one you solve here, okay? And I can't see it myself. Oh, what did I do? Ah, I keep doing that. Anyway, this is where we solve for V0 in terms of a sign. Let me see it now. Yeah, and so that, that's with V0. That's the born time, okay? So you solve for these two. That's, that's your initial conditions. You go back and you plug your initial conditions in here, and you get expressions for the velocity and the, uh, the x-coordinate, the displacement from the atom. And so this is your velocity. This is your um resultant velocity okay and um and this is the distance away from the the atom okay. so you're just solving those um that simple if f equals ma uh, with those but with, but with the boundary conditions the first time i solved this i, I don't know why but i wasn't i wasn't thinking that the boundary conditions were going to have such a big effect but they do okay so this is the um this is the, the, uh, the position away from the atom as a function of time. And it has always depending on omega t uh, or phase compared to um, when it was born, okay? So at the return to the parent ion, at the return, this we'll call return time. And there'll be some phase and some phase, okay? Um, but we know, uh, um, and so, and this is the initial phases. And for this to be zero at the return time, if this is going to be zero, this is just an amplitude of how many nanometers away did it go. So this term has to be zero, must be zero, okay, at the return time, which is called phi sub r. And so, we, in order to know what x of t is, we have to solve this as a function of time, okay, uh, which is all, this, all that this says, okay, we have to do that. And um, when, does it, when does it get back, uh, back to the ion, okay? okay. So it, may have a, it could have a very high cycled average kinetic energy as it's going away from the ion and returning. It can have energies, up 50 or 100 EV, but, uh, the, but doesn't always have that much, it doesn't necessarily have that when it returns. And we'll look at several cases um, when it, um, if, if it was born at phi equals zero at the absolute top of the pulse, we'll find out that it actually returns with zero kinetic energy. It, as it, when it's born, it starts gaining energy, gaining, 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 and starts losing, 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 losing. And by the time, because here it's fighting the electric field, the electric field is slowing it down. So the electric field is accelerating, going up, and then it begins to uh, to turn around and slows it down. And by the time it gets back to the the origin, zero. Okay. It turns out that the highest return energy occurs when the phase is pi over 10 or 18 degrees, so just beyond the peak of the pulse, okay? Okay, and for certain initial, initial times, for times of birth within uh, 90 degrees and, and pi, there is no real solution. There is no, there's no solution, real solution for a return time. It, in fact, the electron never returns at all. So this was a, a diagram we looked at before, and I just moved it in sequence so we could talk about it today. If the electron is born at the peak of the pulse, then it gets pulled off uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the tunneling, brings it off to uh, just free 
with no kinetic energy, it gains a lot of energy actually uh, in, as it cycles in the applied electric field and it comes back and it has no energy. In fact, so this is on half of the pulse where the electric field isn't pointing in one direction, the electron goes on. The other half cycle, the electron's going the other way and it comes back. But in both cases, if they're born at the peak of the pulse here and here, they go in opposite directions, but they always return with no energy. The, inter the, the most interesting case is when the electron is born just after the peak of the pulse at, phi, at uh, a phase of pi over 10 or 18 degrees or 190, um, 198 degrees, et cetera, et cetera. So in the cycle, there will be electrons um, um, returning with actually the highest possible kinetic energy. So that's happening twice every cycle, okay? And then for, um, so, so there's all cases, you can, they can, electrons can be born anywhere, but these are interesting, a couple of the more interesting cases, one where it returns born at the top, returns with no energy, or born at 18 or 198, returns with a lot of energy and throws off a photon with a lot of energy. And the, uh, another interesting case is if the electron is born before the peak of the pulse, in all of these cases, we'll see in a moment, we'll solve for trajectories and we'll see that the electron accelerates away, starts to come back and gets, the electric field has changed again and it goes off and it never returns. So some question about this diagram? Um, I have a question. Yeah. I was wondering, so does it mean that like all of these three processes as well as like, you know, other like positions of the pulse, they all happen at the same time randomly? Well, they're all happening. And, and yes, I guess it's random. You know, the wave is propagating through a gas and the gas is many wavelengths long, right? So some of, some of the, in some plane, the electrons will be, the, atom, the atoms will be seeing the peak of the field, whereas it's at the same instant, a little further along, they'll be seeing some different part of the phase. So this wave is propagating through a gas which, which, which has electrons everywhere, I mean atoms everywhere, and different, uh, different planes in the propagation direction are, seeing, are sampling different parts of the field. So, and this, so, so you're correct, at any given time, there are electrons being emitted at the peak and all of these other phases. Okay, so if the electric field is very weak, well, it's not gonna, not gonna be very effective, but there's lots of opportunity here and they're all happening at the same time. And in the plane transverse to the propagation direction, the location of the atoms is completely random. So there is a randomness factor, but the important, uh, an important effect though, is that no matter when they were born and in what plane, they all propagate in the, for, in the forward direction, they all add in phase. And if they go off to the side, the emitted photon goes off to the side, then it's not gonna add in phase because of the randomness of positions in the horizontal plane. So the only real contribution is going to come from the, what happens in the forward direction. It's something, it's not an obvious concept, but after you think about it for a while, um, uh, Maybe it's important enough for me to, I'll try. You've all seen my handwriting, but this pen is so, so terrible. It's in the, I forget, oops. I'm in the eraser mode, I'm trying to get out of it. There you go, okay, oops. Yeah, so suppose this is our gas, okay? And that's, there are, whoops. There are just these, these atoms are all over the place, right? And in is coming our, our wave, but our wave has got many cycles to it, right? So it might be something like this. Sorry for the drawing capability. Okay, and uh, 
So for instance, all at the same time, so this is this way of moving along this way, all of these atoms along here, they're all seeing the exact phase and, and they're, with the way we're showing it, they're all at the peak of the pulse. So, so maybe another, uh, another bunch of atoms here are all at that eight, magic 18 degrees and they're all emitting again in the forward direction and they're all emitting in a way that's gonna bring back a lot of energy and lead to radiation a little bit later. It doesn't happen instantaneously, right? They have to go away and come back. Um, and, uh, at the, and, and then again, in some other plane, there's some other phase. So this is all happening in, this is an, a glimpse at w one instance of propagation time, but then the, all of these crests move, okay? And what I was saying was, if you looked at the, the atom, the, ra the radiation that's going to come from, uh, let's say all of these atoms here, they're all at, uh, that was a bad choice, wasn't it? I wanna do it just after a peak of the pulse. Uh, where's a good place? Okay, here. So all of those atoms, they're, they're randomly located in this plane. And so if they throw off a photon that way, you can find for sure, because there's a high density of these radiators, you can find another uh, neon atom that's gonna throw off a photon with the exact same energy because they're all in the same lateral plane. That's going to be 180 degrees out of phase with this one, okay? only because of the separation distance between the two of them. They're both throwing, they're both radiating at the same wavelength, but because they're in the, going in, let's say any plane but the forward plane, you find any atom you want going off at any angle you want, you can find another atom in the same plane uh, or nearby that's going to, in, that's going to have just the opposite phase at, at some point. The only place, so they're gonna cancel in all directions except, whoops, except for the forward direction. In the forward direction, it doesn't matter uh, when, when in time they were uh, emitted, but if they were, for instance, all at the peak, they're all gonna add in phase in this direction, okay? And that's where you're gonna get an N squared effect. So if you have a high gas density um, and you have this process going on, um, what will matter is how, how big was the volume of atoms? How many atoms, how many neon or atoms in that volume were emitting, okay? And if that turned out to be a 10 to the ninth or something like that, the electric fields would add constructively to 10 to the ninth. So you'd get, rather than an intensity that depended on E, you get an intensity that depends on E squared, and that's where you pick up this enormous factor. So this process of, by the way, of canceling in any direction, uh, it happens also with the, um, uh, in, in many of the processes, like when we were talking about the scattering of light. Uh, right, from the sun. We, we, we showed that there was a certain uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh scattering and it peaked in the blue and everything else, but you, you also need to have um, fluctuations or if the atmosphere was perfectly quiet um, and there was no fluctuations in density, there would be no blue sky, there'd be no, no color. Okay, so that's the three main things. I think we could go back now to what the calculations were gonna tell us. Yeah, so this is an example for, um, I believe it's for neon, right? What does it say? Um, oh yeah, it's for neon at the bottom, which has an ionization potential of 21.6 EV. And this is at a laser intensity of five times 10 to the 14th watts per centimeter squared. And at this point, it's a tunneling process. There's only a few electrons, ho hopefully only at maximum one per, per a, a atom. Uh, if you push this intensity up, as we saw before, the yield of electrons uh, just increases gigantically. And that's where, uh, that's what they call over the threshold. The laser 
electric field has pushed a threshold down so low that electrons just flow out. And uh, so you don't want to go higher. So experimentally, you play with that because you may not have be able to calculate everything in your lab exactly, uh, but you'll play with that, okay? And for an 800 nanometer um, uh, wavelength at this intensity, we could use that for one of those formulas that we have that converts between uh, intensity and electric field. And if you use that formula, this is what you'll find, six times 10 to the eighth volts per centimeter, which you'll notice is less than the Bohr, the Bohr binding field. And in fact, in all of these atoms, the ionization potential has an equivalent electric field, and it will be greater than this by an order of magnitude. So this is true tunneling process. The equations from the previous page comes out to this. Okay, so the, the displacement is it says about two nanometers times all of these um, cosine and sine factors. And, uh, and by the way, they're gonna add up the, the um, they're going to, for instance, at uh, the peak of the fields, uh, this is gonna be doubled. So this is gonna, we'll wind up seeing in a moment that the displacement will be around four nanometers from the atom, which is quite a long way, okay? And the electron uh, return energies are shown here. So we calculate the velocity like we did the time and then square it to get uh, an, uh, an electron energy as a function of time, okay? And this is it, and this is the formula. And that, for these parameters, for this intensity and, um, and this wavelength, that's just about 60 eV and it depends on this, okay? So um, depends on this difference in angles. And so if phi sub r, this is a constant now, this is some time, birth time. If the return time was equal to the, uh, or a multiple of the birth time, this, this would come to zero, okay? Um, right, so, so that's what this is saying. For a trajectory in which um, the return time is equal to, <laughs> I'm sorry, for, a calculation where phi zero is equal to zero, the, birth, the return time would be, um, would be zero. I mean, the return energy would be zero and the amplitude would be four nanometers. And so that comes from these two equations, okay? And that would give you a return. Um, so there's a maximum of kinetic energy, you can see of 60 eV, plus there was the ionization energy. It took energy to get the electron out now when it comes back with this 60 eV of energy, it's still going to recombine with the atom and in recombining that electron is going to, there's going to be an additional 21 eV. So there's a, as it's, as it's actually recombines, it has all this energy which it releases as a photon. So it's gonna be about 60 eV plus the ionization potential, so around 100 eV, okay? Okay, so this is again about a particular, when you solve those equations, you find that 18 degrees is where you get the maximum performance, okay? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna show you some curves that go with this in just a moment, right? This says the highest photon energy, uh, in, uh, the highest return kinetic energy was actually more than this, this had some factor to it. And so the return energy, the highest, um, the highest photon energy that you could possibly emit is the kinetic energy, which would have been calculated for 18 degrees to be 94.8 eV plus the ionization potential for a total of 116 eV. So that's what you'd get. Uh, there was a question about this before I show you the, the next slide. Okay, this may help. It may help, it may not help. Um, so here's, this is as a function of time in the laser cycle. Here's the electric field, the red dashed line going up and down. So this is one period starting here to here. That would be the two pi of the phase. And, and this just goes on and on and on. But this, this is enough for the calculation we want. So this is uh, our assumed 
It's neon, five times 10 to the 14th watts per centimeter squared, lambda equals 800 nanometers. And this is the solution to those equations uh, as a function of birth time, which isn't quite so clear, but the first one was just right here. And then there are birth times all along, all along this time axis, there are different birth times. And what are shown are a few sample curves for interesting birth times, okay? So for instance, uh, the one that was born just at zero, it goes away and it comes back and it returns to the axis. This is distance from the ion. So just in this region, it's shown as purple on purpose. It's, um, whoops, I don't want the purple one. I, I want the, these others that come back at zero. Okay, so this would be the first one, I think. Whoops. I uh, don't have that quite right, do I? At any rate, these are the trajectories. And l let's look at the purple one, the 18. So this is one that was born at um, pi over 10, pi over 10. So around here someplace, 18 degrees. It's born around here and it goes away. Uh, be, the direction of the laser field in this, this case is driving it down and bringing it back, okay? And uh, this is the place where it's, uh, we want it to cross the axis again, and this is where it's crossing the axis, okay? okay? And this is where it would continue, okay? And then there are all, all other different cases. And what we have plotted here is, um, um, so we've plotted a little bit more than we need to, because on that one, we only would have to go this far. That would be the return and it would have what, whatever we calculated for kinetic energy, okay? Uh, this is showing a graph uh, versus time here, uh, or phi. So it's just showing this region here, just going out to pi over two. So this, is, this graph is showing the return kinetic energy for electrons in this region that were born from zero to, what does it say, about pi over two. So just those, and th these are their returns. This is where they're, they're returning, okay? And this is showing what was their return kinetic energy calculated from those equations. So for this case that we've been looking at, uh, it's getting up to 90 something EV. This is just the return kinetic energy. We haven't added in the ionization potential yet, but we had a formula that the maximum return energy uh, depended on the ionization potential plus 3.17 UP. And if you calculate it, uh, this is a perfect match to that constant. Where did the 3.17 come from? It comes from these calculations and that's exactly what you get, okay? So let's see what the conclusions are down here. Uh, for an in initial phase phi zero, the electron gains significant kin energy, kinetic energy, but returns with none, simply oscillating with a four nanometer excursion amplitude. For phases between pi over 10 or 18 degrees, the maximum kinetic energy is achieved, 94.8 in this case, and the same for 198, it's just going in the other direction. So this 94.8, that must be what this peak value is right here, that must be 94.8. And electrons emerging from the tunneling process at initial phases, ex extending from here to here, uh, just before the peak of the pulse never returned. So, so those who were born in this region would, um, would, would be like in this case up here. They just go and they never, never come back again. Actually, they'd be a little bit worse than this. Okay. And uh, I noticed that the same return energy, kinetic energy occurs twice um, because the electric field, twice per cycle. Okay. Okay. So um, this is showing, this is, this, is this, this is just a down selection of interesting trajectories. And then what it's showing is, so here's our one at 18 degrees and, and then a couple others that are a little bit off from that. So they're not quite the maximum. And this is the return kinetic energy. So this was the 94.8 that we just saw for 18 degrees. But if you looked at a phase that was a little bit earlier than that, it drops a little. If it was a little bit later than that, 
it also drops. This was the peak. So they're both dropping a few electron volts. And then these are other extreme cases, uh, a little bit further from the, uh, the optimum. But now this is the return kinetic energy. If you add the total kinetic energy, add the ionization potential to this, this is, the this is the return energy that the electron has that can then be emitted in a photon. Photons can be emitted with less than this because they came from different birth times, okay? So this one would be 93 EV. That's gonna be there, okay? But you may put a filter in the process. You like might a multi-layer mirror or something else. You may choose to look at a bandwidth just around here, okay? So for instance, this is um, between five EV to either side. So this would be a bandwidth. These three would be captured within a bandwidth around the center of 5%, okay? They're 5% of the energy. So you could, make, you could make some sort of filter combination or multi-layer mirror filter combination that just captures five, only allows for energies within the peak of about five EV uh, percentage-wise, okay? So let's follow back at the time of those three. That would mean between this curve, this curve, and this curve, that's what we're talking about. Well, this curve here, it returned at this time. And this curve here, the, the other side, this one is returned, whoops, did I lose it? I did lose it. It's this curve here coming back. So this is the return times for these three cases, okay, for three, three different birth times. So within that band, all of these are within a 200 out of second pulse. So if you put a filter on this, you are going to get, you may have started with some, some femtosecond uh, driver, but the, but the photon energies that are produced within a 5% band are going to be, uh, are going to, be, uh, uh, could be associated or manipulated into a 200 out of second pulse. Okay. And yeah, so the process repeats every cycle. It could be a lot of cycles, right? The femtosecond pulse could have been uh, maybe 1.5 cycles would be a really short, uh, about as almost as short as you can get, or it could be, you know, 30 cycles or something like that. Uh, for a sort of an, a longer pulse, but at any rate, um, it's twice per cycle in all of those cycles at 190 and you'll get the maximum return. And that's what's shown here, okay? So here's our, our um, laser electric field. It's going, it has a certain number of cycles and at 18 degrees, 198, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're gonna throw off photons in the forward direction, all with the same photon energies, okay? Or with the same spread of photon energies and they are all gonna add in phase. And so if you look at the peak emission, this is showing, you know, the peak emission comes at some delay time because the electron has gotta go away and come back, has to go away and come back again. And so this is showing the pulses and they're delayed, but uh, there are two per cycle. They're shifted, but basically there are this the separation here is a half cycle. So you're going to get this wave train is going to be produced um, of pulses. Pulses of radiation are going to come out like this. And um, and if you did a um, oh this is just what the delay, the delay time is between the birth and um, return, which we could go back and see if you want, but um, so these were the conditions and uh, shown here is uh, the harmonic number 61. They're always odd and um, this would be the, the energy, but you can also see, um, anyway, there's these very symmetric pulses. There's, there's nothing in the middle here and you can use, you can take, and this is very sharp. Remember it was like, Although this could have been femtoseconds, this might have been only 200 attoseconds was the numerical case we looked at. So this is a very sharp, so this is the photons are coming out with this sharp pulse structure. And if you did a Fourier transform of that, 
you would get the um, uh, you would see that you're only going to get these even harmon uh, odd harmonics. That's all you can get out of this. The only way you could get some even harmonics is if the field wasn't so perfectly symmetric. The emission times were not perfectly symmetric. Uh, some people do that by mixing in not only the 800 nanometer, but a little bit of the 400 nanometer by doubling uh, a portion of the, the laser, okay? Anyway, so here you are showing, you're going to produce a wave train uh, of pulses where the maximum, the highest energy photons are 116 eV. So now, now these electrons have gone, gained energy, gone away, come back, have their return energy, and we want them to recombine with the parent ion, come back and hit that same ion, but they've gone four nanometers away, and now they've got to come back, and they've got to find that. And there's a little spread in that. In fact, this a way to look at this is uh, sort of a, a quantum mechanical way, if you wish, um, the electron is emitted from a tiny little space and it's going out in velocity and uh, there's a spread that. It's like a wave front, a wave, an electron wave is going out and it's not going, there's nothing to refocus it back to the same spot. So they call that quantum diffusion and um, basically it's an electron wave packet emerges from the the transversely confined emission point, the angstrom scale of the atom, and it moves away from the ion in a divergent wave packet, okay? And um, Paul Corkum and, uh, and Terence Krauss estimate that the spreading is about five angstroms of spread per femtosecond, okay? So a two femtosecond spread gets you a nanometer of, um, um, a one nanometer spread to the return electron wave packet. Uh, so, the, um, whereas the atom is only 0 0.1 nanometers wide, an angstrom, right? So you've got a factor of, um, of 10 and it's an area thing, so it's squared. So that means just based on these numbers, you would say, oh, the best we're gonna do is like a 1% uh, recombination probability. So here are, these are experimental curves and this has to do with the conversion efficiency. So this is that last step, the electrons coming back, what's the likelihood, what's the uh, likelihood that it's going to produce harmonic radiation in a certain band? And so it's shown for argon, neon, helium, etc. For harmonic orders, again, they're going to be all odd numbers. And uh, this is the actual conversion efficiency into a single harmonic. So if you're asking how much is going to go into harmonic 61, which I'm going to use in my experiment, this is saying, well, the numbers are going to be like efficiencies of 10 to the minus 8 into that uh, particular harmonic. And uh, by the way, you see these comments here, here about, um, well, you see, the efficiency, and then there's a rollover at a certain point. And um, the different harmonic orders, but they're saying this is where the carbon edge is, okay, and the oxygen edge. So this is what we call the water window. And many people working on high harmonics want to get to higher photon energies to get to more of the core-like um, uh, binding energies of atoms, okay? So they want to get into this region, but there's something causing it to drop off, okay? And uh, so we're going to look at that in just a moment. Um, but this gives you some idea of what kind of efficiencies people get higher in Arga because there are more electrons available. Okay. And then, uh, yeah. So this particular figure appears, it, it appeared in an, um, an early research paper, but it's been reproduced over and over again because it captures something really important. Uh, one thing is how, how much gas, what size of gas volume at some density, uh, how big 
can you make that? You, we were talking about n squared, where the amount of power out converted into a particular harmonic depends on the number of atoms in this region that you're illuminating, the so-called interaction region between the laser light and the gas. Uh, how big can that be at, at a certain density? Can you just make it wider and wider and wider? Therefore, increase n and increase n squared. What's what's limiting that? And he, they they have two regions that they identify here. For the lower harmonics, uh, lower harmonics, lower photon energies. There's more absorption, and actually, how how big a volume you can use is absorption limited. The photons that you're generating are simply being reabsorbed by the atoms. At higher photon energies, absorption is not so important, and what's called dephasing limits you. And I think I mentioned that briefly. That's dephasing, meaning that the, um, the driving laser uh, electric field, the driving laser wave fronts are propagating at a different speed than the EUV that they produce, so that the EUV that was produced in the beginning of the process becomes out of phase with its own wavelength, with, its, with radiation at its own wavelength further down the gas. And that's what we call dephasing. So maybe I'll come back and talk about that. Okay, oh, and so scaling of efficiency. This is a formula that we had on, I think, our first or second slide that said that the highest photon energy we could get was the ionization potential plus this I lambda squared. Yeah, okay. And uh, in one of the graphs I said, oh, there's the 3.17. This is the 3.17. So when the early works were done, they thought this was a number around three just from the experiments they were doing. But um, uh, mathematically, this is what it is, and it comes from those uh, equations that we looked at before. So if you were trying to get to higher photon energies, if you wanted to get out here in the so-called water window or get to the carbon edge, you want to get to higher photon energies, this tells you that you should increase lambda. So there are a lot of people now working on using something different than uh, than Thai sapphire at 800 nanometer. What about other lasers that work at somewhat longer wavelengths? A little bit longer, not too much longer. Um, it goes as the square, so you could say, hmm, boy, this would be really good if I increase this lambda by three, go to 2.4 nanometers rather than, uh, I'm sorry, microns rather than 800 nanometers, I could get a factor of 10 in this term. Okay, so that would be a lot. But unfortunately, when we looked at the, um, the amplitude of oscillation, uh, it depends on how far the electron goes in excursion away from the parent ion before it comes back again. This term has one over omega squared. So there's a lambda squared here in the excursion distance. So if you were to, let's say, triple the wavelength so that you could get a factor of 10, then you would triple um, you would triple the wavelength and the excursion distance would go up by a factor of nine and the recombination possibility would drop pretty precipitously. So when people play this game, they're trying to push out the laser wavelength, uh, use a longer driving wavelength, they, they, they will get more power, it appears from that, they will generate more power for sure in the return electron energies, but the, re the, uh, the likelihood, the probability of recombination is just dropping, dropping, dropping. So, but that's an active area of research in the field, okay? Okay. So this is just a review of what we just talked about. Okay, the IR, IR pulse trains um, generate high harmonic through a constructive and through constructive and destructive interference. There are twice the number of EUV pulses as IR circles uh, cycles. The IR pulses each generate um, uh, a, a continuum because it wasn't just radiation from the peak, the 18 degrees, but to either side of it. So there is a continuum of radiation coming out. Okay, there is a symmetric pulse structure in time. And that, the symmetry of that, if you do a Fourier transform, you only need odd harmonics. You don't need any 
even harmonics to explain that pulse. And that's what you see. You only see odd harmonics as long as it's symmetric as shown, okay? Um, even harmonics appear only if the, this, the um, symmetry in time is broken, okay? A Fourier analysis would indicate that you're just gonna get these harmonics and what, and what harmonics you're going to see. And, oh, what is the pulse width? How, how wide is the pulse? Well, there are, there are N, let's say capital N is the number of infrared cycles in the driving laser pulse. So let's say that was 10. So you would say, okay, well, because of that alone, we would think there's a one over 10 bandwidth. We've done this before. You have 10 cycles, you, have, you expect Fourier transform to get a one over N cycle, uh, band, relative spectral bandwidth. But actually, besides, for each infrared cycle, they'll produce many harmonics of uh, higher and higher harmonics. And so, for instance, for the 61st harmonic, uh, and let's say the infrared had 10 cycles, each of the 10 is producing 61 harmonic cycles, and the combination is 10 times 61. It's 610. And so the relative spectral bandwidth to first order is going to be one over this number. Okay, so you can get something approaching a band a spectral bandpass of one part in, um, of maybe two parts in a thousand. Okay, uh, if you have only a single IR pulse, there's, not, there's nothing to interfere. It's just that one pulse going through the gas, you don't have these many cycles and many areas um, generating similar wavelengths to interfere. So uh, with the I, if there, if there's only a single IR pulse, you're not gonna see any harmonics. You're gonna just have a broad spectrum of all the radiation that could have uh, happened for the different birth times, okay? And this, by the way, is a way to get to add a second pulses. One of the ways. So the next part is spatial and temporal coherence of high harmonic radiation. Uh, so let's go through one or two of these slides. The, um, the condition we found ourselves for coherent radiation, spatially coherent radiation, is that the size times the full angle be approximately lambda over two when these are both full width half max quantities, okay? And uh, in this case, the laser light is driving the process. Coherent laser light, at, let's say 800 nanometers, is driving this process. So it's coherent across its entire wavefront, okay? It is coherent. It does satisfy this relationship itself, and the radiation it produces does also. So, so the the um, uh, the spatial coherence of the high high, high harmonic generated radiation is largely imprinted from that of the coherent laser wavefront. Okay, and this is true despite the randomness of the atoms in the gas. It doesn't matter where the electrons where the atoms were in the gas, in the forward direction, they're all gonna add up in phase, and you're gonna maintain, maintain that high spatial coherence. Um, you're gonna maintain spatial coherence to a very high degree, okay? Um, yeah, so this is again, just that the, in the forward direction, the fields add in phase, okay? And the, the intensity of the radiation, the intensity, a technical word, power per unit area, is proportional to the number of participating atoms in the interaction region squared. Okay. The electric field, Ooh, what does this say? The, oh, the, the electric fields uh, are proportional to the number, okay? The intensity is proportional to electric fields squared, okay? And in other directions, as we spoke, the, the radiation generally cancels out. It's not zero, but it becomes so small compared to the E squared effect in the forward direction, it's negligible. So here's some um, Young's double slit experiment results. This is for, this is the full beam. Uh, this is with, I forget if we were using, yeah, pinholes, okay. This was a work of, um, Yan Wei Lu in Berkeley was doing the spatial stuff, and um, 
Randy Bartles, uh, the Boulder Group, uh, who is now a professor at, at Fort Collins, who was, uh, which was another partner. We had a three university partnership. But anyway, is Yan Wei who made the coherence uh, images. These are the conditions. The laser wavelength was 760, it was a 25 femtosecond pulse. There was argon atoms at 29 tor. This was the intensity. This is radiation that's been isolated for the 21st harmonic, which is 34 EV. And this is the wavelength that goes with that. Um, and the amount of energy coming in the pulses were like 10 to the eighth photons per pulse at five kilohertz. And Yanwei, for this Young's double slit, it was double pinhole experiment, he used two 50 micron pinholes separated at different distances uh, from 20, uh, yeah, okay. And so for instance, here, he's got the two pinholes separated by 142 microns, and he's got absolutely full modulation, and then he separates them further and it's going like this. Does it say what the beam, doesn't say what the beam uh, diameter was at the Young's, at that. But this is basically, you can see what it is. This is the full, the full beam. And, and now here he's moving the pinholes so they're on the edges. And um, for instance here, there's still the fields outside. This is putting the two pinholes way outside the beam. So where you're just looking at the exponential tails of a probably near, near Gaussian, but you're just looking at the tails and there's still a high degree of coherence, even with, uh, with the pinholes separated by, it looks like, oh, half a dozen times the beam size, okay? So that was measuring spatial coherence and it was published in Think and Science. Doesn't say, does it? No, okay, it doesn't say, but Randy Bartels was the first author and uh, it's, I'm sure it's a reference in the book, okay? So that was the spatial uh, coherence. And then for temporal coherence, we need to know what is the wavelength? That depends on the 800 nanometers or whatever it was, 780 divided by the harmonic number. That will give you, um, the wavelength, the new wavelength, and the spectral bandwidth is, we were saying, would be this, depend on this product, Hn, okay? So the product of the, uh, <coughs> the number of IR cycles N and the, and the laser harmonic number H give you relative spectral bandwidths which can approach one part in a thousand, for instance. And it's not too dependent on whether it's a beautiful rectangular wavelength where the early cycle amplitude and the late cycle amplitude is this constant amplitude process, you do the Fourier transform and you get this relative spectral bandwidth as shown here, okay? The, the, the so-called sink squared pattern that we saw in the, sink, in the undulator case. But even if you had a Gaussian wave product, same number of cycles, but now it's a Gaussian, not a, not just a rectangle, okay? Uh, if it's a Gaussian envelope, but the same frequency and the same number of cycles and you Fourier transform it, um, now you don't get a sink squared pattern, you get a Gaussian spectral distribution, but the relative spectral width, the relative spectral bandwidth is almost identical. It hardly has changed, you know? One part in a hundred or something like that. So, uh, so anyway, our band, the bandwidth that we're expecting to first order is basically this one over NH. So that's a simple thing. Uh, this is some, this is an ex example from Thomas Pfeiffer, who after leaving Berkeley went to the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. And this is some, some data that he and his group produced with absolutely beautiful harmonics at these different wavelengths. These are the parameters, um, and uh, they had an n equals 30, this 80 femtoseconds divided by, uh, at 80 nanometers, the wavelength is uh, uh, eight, th eight thirds of a femtosecond. So that gives you, uh, any, that means you, this 80 femtosecond pulse corresponds to 30 uh, periods in the infrared. 
and he's looking here at the harmonic number 69. So here's 67 and here's 71. So this is the guy. This is harmonic 69. And it's a matter of what is the width of this. Okay. And by the way, this um, wavelength for this harmonic 69 is 11.6 nanometers or 107 eV. And if you apply the formula that we just said, the relative spectral bandwidth should be 1 over nh, which is roughly 30 times 70. It's a little over 2,000. So what went wrong here? And I showed you this on purpose, and I don't know the answer. And, um, but somehow or other, you would hope that the spectral bandwidth here was 1 over 2,000. But actually, um, the report from Thomas says that it's actually 1 over 500. So I haven't. I went back and I read the paper, but I haven't found the discrepancy yet. Or what are the effects that are taking a very narrow spectrum and broadening it to some degree? So that's a question for us. I, I don't, I myself don't know the answer. But if it is 500, then the coherence length in the longitudinal direction, the, the temporal coherence, uh, is you know one half lambda squared over delta lambda, and um, and we, which we break up into one half lambda times lambda over delta lambda. So this is the spectral bandwidth. And that comes out to about three microns. So it's spatially coherent in the lateral direction and temporally coherent with about three microns in the propagation direction. Okay. So this is just a summary of those things. Of the first few things are just a summary of that. Okay. Uh, with the caveat that there's something can spoil that, and I'm surprised it spoiled it so much in that experiment. But I'll check my emails with Thomas because I remember us exchanging emails over what could cause that. And then, then that, and I think what we'll get to next time is these ato second pulses. How do you get ato second pulses? We sort of had a picture of it before on one of the slides, but there's some more to be looked at there. So. Um, so the, the chemistry community is trying to use this, uh, these pulses to interrogate electron distributions in molecules as they're, as something's perturbing them. And, uh, uh, Steve Leone and, and colleagues created this phrase, transient absorption spectroscopy. If with, if they get really short pulses of, let's say 100 attoseconds, that's a really good short time for probing electron dynamics. And it's so short, it has a really broad spectrum. So if they can create something and then probe it with this attosecond pulse, it'll have a broad spectrum and they can choose to locate the, the breadth of that spectrum to see different absorption features and, um, and track that as it, as it evolves on the scale of sub-femtosecond duration. 100 data second. So the next time we get together, we'll, we'll speak about that. And by the way, this is our expression. Remember, this came from just Fourier transforms, if you want, where this is uh, H bar delta omega, delta omega, delta T. This is um, what that convert, and this is also just Fourier transform business. But it says that if you have a certain um, energy bandwidth, Okay, the shortest pulse you can get is shown here. And the combination goes with 18 EV goes with 100 attoseconds. So this is, this would be 100 attoseconds would be 0 0.1 femtoseconds. So you put 0 0.1 femtoseconds here, divide through, the femtoseconds cancel, and the 0 0.1 uh, must have been divided by, actually. It's divided by 0 0.1, so you get 18 eV. So you're going to need a broad bandwidth to get very short pulses, for sure. And let me just see. Yeah, so here's a, here's a set of curves. It'll be the last thing we look at today. Um, and this is from Yanwei Lu, who um, graduated from as and and he did a different thesis. He did a thesis on the coherence of real uh, atomic EUV lasers, but he also did a lot of other things. You see, he, he comes up in many places. He came up also with Chris Rosefield in the spatially filtered undulator radiation, all those beautiful um, 
interference patterns we saw. But what he plots here is around a wavelength of 13.5 uh, nanometers, which is around uh, just under 100 eV. It's actually just below the silicon L edge at 99 point something eV. And this is showing if you have an interference, a multi-layer interference coating on your optic and you have 40 bilayers, that means 40 moly, 40, 40 silicon alternating, this would be this, the width of that curve. And if you have only 20 bilayers, well, it's going to be a little bit broader, the lighter gray coming out here, okay? And he shows other examples. If you only have 10 bilayers or five bilayers, how much broader is. The reflectivity is going down. So as the number of bilayers is going, uh, is going down, for sure the reflectivity is going down because it depends on, again, the square of the number of, of interfaces. Um, but what he's showing here is how many, um, what if you want a spectrum that's 200 attoseconds to measure the, the previous slide where we were here we were saying if you wanted 18 EV bandwidth, 180, 100 for 100 attoseconds. Anyway, here's a 200 attosecond, and it would require oh a little bit more than 10 bilayers, okay, to make that kind of a coding. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is where we'll start the next time. How do we generate? At a second pulses. So, does anyone want to raise some issues or uh, have questions about what was happening there? What is today? Is today Thursday? Yeah. So, today is Thursday, so we're off next week. Yippee. <laughs> uh, I hope you all enjoy a week off or use it in part to catch up on the projects that you were falling behind on. But for sure, get some time off. If you want to be successful over the years, of the, the years of your PhD thesis time, or even over a career, you absolutely have to take breaks. If life isn't enjoyable, you'll, you'll turn away from what you're doing and you'll become a real estate broker or something like that. So don't do it. Take some time off. It is extremely important. See your friends, see your family. Who knows what? Go fishing. <laughs> Okay, have a great time. Have a wonderful week off. And I'll see you the following Tuesday. Oh, and so the following Tuesday, we'll probably do the, um, the attosecond stuff. And then um, we may get a, a tour, a virtual tour of Michael Zurch's uh, high harmonic lab. Okay. And um, uh, so uh, we'll have to see. I'll look at how many slides we have for the next time. And we can decide um, uh, when to fit it in. So Bailey, yeah. Bailey, about how long is this um, uh, video of visiting the laser lab? Do you know? I think it's like five or ten minutes. Five or ten? Minutes. Like, oh, yeah, okay. Five minutes or so. It's just a quick. Okay, hold on a second and let's just see how, whoops. Let's just see how many slides are left. Uh, and then we can figure out, is it, is it gonna be on Tuesday when we come back or Thursday when we come back? Whoops. So we're over here. This is where we are at slide 39. And it goes to 63. If it, this is a part I want to do for sure. I think we could do it at the end of, the, of, of Tuesday. Can you just be ready for Tuesday? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it's possible. There's a sort of a messy business here of, of how long should the propagation path be in the gas? And is it limited by absorption or dephasing? And um, I put together, you, you can read in, in the book, in the chapter, uh, what, what I gave two approaches. Um, my seat of the pants approach for the dephasing 
and then a more what what's a traditional uh, harmonic conversion um, defacing kind of thing um, uh, but how much of that is worth sh going through I think I think we'll be able to get done one of the things we'll show next week on Tuesday at the end this is just for the people who are working on high harmonics there always there's always this interest in what is the refractive index of a plas of a of an electron plasma because it it can lead to dephasing and so many times in high harmonics you want to know what this is and I'm just going to show you what it is in four steps actually three steps three slides and so you'll have that and you'll understand that really well you can then find some book to reference it there are common references but they never explain it in such simple terms and this these are slides taken from the plasma section which will come later but at any rate, I think for the high harmonic people, it, it's a slide, it starts with Maxwell's equations, it defines an uh, electron density and, and uh, the current density, and it brings you down to you know, a wave equation, which has an identifiable phase velocity, and from that you get refractive. So I'll show that to you. It, I think it'd be useful to the high harmonic people. So I think with that, we are, we are ready to go. Um, so everybody okay? Um, have a great week. Okay, bye. Thank you.